Great. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Emmy Betts. I'm the director of the Firearm Injury Prevention Initiative here at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. Um, and we are thrilled to be hosting this webinar today in honor of uh, National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We felt it was really important to do something specific to firearms, domestic violence, uh, and that important overlap. Many thanks to Daphna Rubin, who is a student here at the School of Public Health, who did all of the legwork in putting together this incredible panel today. Um, we will put some links in the chat for um, people who are interested in learning more about the programs mentioned, um, or uh, if you wanna see past webinars, we will be recording this and we will send out the link to everyone who registered. Uh, so um, a couple other quick comments before we start. So um, the, the presenters have asked me to give them a heads up on timing. So please don't be surprised if you hear me butting in. Um, please put any questions you have in the Q&A uh, box and we'll have a moderated question and answer at the end of all three presentations. And now it is my great honor to introduce our speakers today. So first we have researcher and criminologist, Dr. April Zioli from the University of Michigan. Uh, she's gonna be giving an overview on the topic and talking about the effectiveness of various uh, policies intended to address the threat of intimate partner violence and firearms. Uh, next, we have UC Health Forensic uh, Program Manager, Christine Foot Lucero, who will be giving us a clinician's perspective on what she sees with patients who experience intimate partner violence when they present in the emergency department, how uh, she and her team assess danger, and how that assessment is impacted by the presence of a firearm. And then last but not least, we are thrilled to have Abigail Hansen with us. She's the Chief Program Officer of Safe House Denver, and she'll be providing uh, more of the perspective about uh, a perspective of women who are experiencing intimate partner violence involving a firearm. Um, I think that our presenters will also touch on this. We want to acknowledge that intimate partner violence does happen in many forms um, across genders. Um, most commonly victims are women. And so you may hear us focusing um, on women more today, but we do want to acknowledge this is an issue that can affect everyone. And I'll turn it over to our team now. Thank you so much for joining us. So I am first up. Um, Daphne, can you go to my first slide? I am April Zioli. Um, my slides I'm sure will be up in a moment, but I'm gonna talk to you about an intimate partner violence and guns as Emmy said. And the first thing I wanna mention is that Intimate partner violence is incredibly common. There's my first slide. Can you go to the second one next? Can you go to the next one, please? So intimate partner violence is incredibly common, but rates of intimate partner violence do vary by racial group. On this graph, we can see that people who identify as multiracial experience uh, the largest lifetime and 12 month prevalence of intimate partner violence of any of the other racial groups. And they're followed by American Indian, Alaska Natives, and then non-Hispanic Black uh, people. And it varies a little bit more for the 12 month, um, but this is non-fatal intimate partner violence. If we looked at fatal intimate partner violence, so intimate partner homicide, it's a little bit more difficult to look at it by race due to the data systems, the way the data are collected. But we know that intimate partner homicide rates for Black people right now are about two times that of intimate partner homicide rates for white people. And this is actually the closest those rates have been since they started doing this type of uh, data collection in the mid 1970s. It, in the early 1980s, the rate of intimate partner homicide for black people was about eight times that for white people. So again, we're seeing great racial differences in intimate partner violence and intimate partner homicide. Next slide, please. Now I can't give racial breakdowns in non-fatal gun uses because those data simply are not there but 3.4% of intimate partner violence events involve a firearm. 
And a lot of us are going to say 3.4%. That's not much. But again, domestic violence is so common that that's 90 gun-involved, non-fatal domestic violence events every single day in the United States. And abusers use guns to intimidate their victims, to coerce them, to threaten them. And it's really effective because I don't know about you, but I'm going to do whatever the person with the gun tells me to do. And I suspect that I'm not rare in that. So it's an effective tool to use, unfortunately. It's a scary tool to have used against you. In fact, people who experience gun-involved domestic violence have more symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder than people who experience domestic violence when there is no gun use. So it takes a greater toll on the victimized individuals, even when there aren't shots fired. Because of the effectiveness of gun use, abusers, it looks like right now in the literature, don't need to use as much actual physical violence. So what this means is that that evidence that you know, they might have had if they were hit or choked, the bruises, the marks, that's not there. You know, and that could make a difference you know, in any criminal cases, in getting people to believe them. If a gun is pointed at you, that does not leave physical marks, it leaves psychological marks. And those are hard to prove. You know, it's hard to prove that somebody held a gun against you if nobody else saw it. Next slide, please. So there are two pie charts on this graph and I wanna address the one to the right first. And this is the relationship of intimate partner homicide perpetrators to victims. And you can see here that current or former spouses make up 45% of those who commit intimate partner homicide and dating partners make up the other 55%. Now, it didn't used to be this way. The percentage of intimate partner homicide perpetrators that is dating partners has been steadily growing over the years. And it's been steadily growing as our average age at marriage has been increasing. You know, my mother got married in 1973 at the age of 20. She tells me she was considered an old maid. 20 years ago, I got married at 27. And that was roughly the average age for women to get married. And now it's older than that. So we're spending a lot more time dating than we used to. And dating partners are committing those homicides. The pie chart on the left is weapons used in family homicide. So this isn't just intimate partner homicide. It covers the killing of children, parents, and siblings as well. And you can see that the majority of these homicides are committed with guns. If I had put just intimate partners, it would be about 58% committed with guns. But I chose to present family homicides for a very specific reason. And that reason is because a lot of intimate partner, a lot of intimate partner homicide perpetrators also kill other people in addition to the intimate partner. When a gun is used in intimate partner homicide, there are more likely to be additional victims than when a gun is not used. Now, that doesn't mean that the majority of intimate partner homicides that occurred with a gun involve additional victims. It's still a much smaller percentage than that. But we are seeing a lot of you know, child victims and the majority of mass shootings in this country defined as four or more fatal victims are family mass shootings. So that's covered in this pie chart. Next slide, please. Fortunately, there are steps that we can take to make people safer. Domestic violence restraining order firearm restriction laws is one of those steps. And that's where when somebody is under a domestic violence restraining order, they cannot purchase or possess a gun for the lifetime of that order. When the order is lifted, they get their gun rights back. And research suggests that these firearm restrictions are associated with reductions 
in firearm intimate partner homicide and total intimate partner homicide. And this is at the state and city level. The reason I include total intimate partner homicide here is because it's really important. You've probably heard people say, if somebody wants to kill someone else and they don't have a gun, they're just going to find a different way to kill them. If that were playing out in these domestic violence scenarios, then what we would see is a decrease in intimate partner homicides committed with firearms, but no change in total intimate partner homicide as people just used other weapons instead of guns. But that's not what we see. We see a decrease in intimate partner homicides, suggesting that lives are saved. And there are three, three specific uh, policy provisions within this firearm restraining order, I'm sorry, firearm restriction law that seem to make the difference in reducing intimate partner homicide. Colorado actually has each of these provisions. And the first one is that dating partners are included under those who can be restricted. You saw the previous pie chart. The federal government does not include dating partners under those who can be restricted, and many states do not include dating partners. Yet these are dangerous situations, and including them does have an associated reduction in intimate partner homicide. Having firearm restrictions available for those ex parte or emergency restraining orders, the ones that are put in place really quickly before a hearing can be held, also seems to reduce intimate partner homicide. And we think that's because these restraining orders are petitioned for in cases where you know, there's often some event that makes someone think now is the time to petition for this order. There's often a very violent event and the person has decided that they're leaving their intimate partner. And that's a very dangerous time when an abuser is realizing that maybe they don't have full control over this person. So getting the guns out of their hand at that stage seems important. The final is that when a state has a law that specifically says that a judge can or must order them to relinquish any guns they have, there is a reduction that's associated with this law in intimate partner homicide. And this one is kind of a no-brainer. If someone is not supposed to have a gun because they are too dangerous to have a gun, we should probably take away the guns that are now illegal instead of just allowing them to continue to have the guns that we think they're too dangerous to have. And again, that is associated with reduction in intimate partner homicide, a 12% reduction. Next slide, please. Colorado also has extreme risk protection orders or red flag laws. And these are civil court orders that temporarily suspend a person's Second Amendment rights. So much like a domestic violence restraining order, they cannot purchase or possess a gun for the lifetime of that order. Once the order is lifted, they get their rights back. And 19 states, including Colorado and the District of Columbia, currently have this law. And on the right hand of your screen, you can see I uh, put in a photo of the kind of the front page of Colorado's petition for an extremist protection order. Now, these are for cases in which someone really is in imminent danger of harming themselves or others. These are not, you know, cases where someone says one day, gosh, I wish I were dead. And that's all they do. These are cases where there is a crisis or there is imminent danger, such as in certain domestic violence cases, and nothing else has worked yet. You know, they're not voluntarily giving up their guns. They, you know, have guns. They've threatened with them. Um, so in those cases, an extremist protection order is appropriate. And you can see here in Colorado, family or household members can petition for this order. So if you have a family or household member, such as an intimate partner or a child or a parent, um, you can see the uh, relationships here, who is really an immediate danger to themselves or others, you can petition the court 
and the court will evaluate the evidence that is presented and decide whether they should have that emergency extremist protection order that works much the same way as domestic violence, you know, restraining orders. There's that emergency or ex parte order. And then if they grant it or if they don't, a couple of weeks later, there'll be a hearing and the person who you are saying is an imminent danger can attend that hearing, can explain why they think they don't need the extreme risk protection order, or as often ha happens, they can stipulate to the order and you know, say, okay, I agree to have this order right now and you know, relinquish their guns and not try to buy new ones. Hey, April, that's about a two minute warning. Thanks. I, I'm actually almost done. So, but thank you. Uh, so these can be used for intimate partner violence. We don't have evidence yet on uh, their use or their effectiveness with intimate partner violence because these are very new legislative tools. In Colorado, you only got yours at the beginning of 2020. So that's not a lot of years of data for us to work with. Um, you know, but I and uh, Amy Betts are working on a large study of six states, Colorado is one of them, where we're looking at the use of extremist protection orders under many circumstances, including intimate partner violence. We hope to have more news for you on that front within the next year or so. Uh, next slide, which should just be like in any questions. Oh, my final message, sorry about that. So my final message, the things I want you to take away from this, uh, from my part of the presentation is that violence is preventable. We have you know, these legal tools, domestic violence, restraining order, firearm restrictions that seem to prevent intimate partner homicide. Colorado has a great domestic violence restraining order, firearm restriction law, and you know, use it you know, to the full extent of the law. Possibly, though, more implementation needs to happen. The extent to which law enforcement officers and, and judges in Colorado are actually ordering relinquishment of guns, even though you have a relinquishment law, is unknown. And having worked in many, many states, uh, I suspect that there are places in Colorado that really aren't doing relinquishment at all, again, despite having that law. So better implementation of these laws could prevent violence further. Thank you. And that's it for me. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna take over here with the clinician's perspective. I have been a nurse for 21 years and I currently manage our forensic nursing program at university. Next slide. So some of you may be wondering what is forensic nursing if you have not heard of this before. We are nurses that specialize in caring for patients that are affected by violence. And our populations can be uh, anywhere on the life spectrum, birth through death. We um, not only provide that clinical care, but we also are all trained in evidence gathering. So items that could potentially hold evidentiary value and then how to collect those uh, properly so that they can be used in court. Um, and then we all do additional training for testifying as expert witnesses. So really what it comes down to is forensic nursing is the one area um, or arena essentially in healthcare where healthcare and um, the legal system converge. Next slide. So patients that are affected by violence is certainly a broad um, grouping of patients. So there's some different examples here of those patients that we would specialize in and consult on. So sexual assault, um, intimate partner violence, human trafficking, child abuse, elder abuse, gunshot wounds, stabbings, auto pedestrian or some of those types of vehicular assaults or incidences, near hangings, strangulation, and physical assault. Um, you often 
may hear intimate partner violence and domestic violence used interchangeably. There is a slight distinction. Um, domestic violence really, especially in the legal world, can be anything domestic, so anything potentially in a household. So if two brothers um, you know, live together and they're arguing and police get called out, that would be listed as a domestic argument. Um, and then intimate partner violence is just really that very specific type of domestic violence that involves um, current or former partners um, that were either in or are currently in a romantic relationship. So if you ever hear IPV or DV, that's just that slight distinction there. Next slide. So intimate partner violence, um, what does that mean? I think it's important for us to define that. So a lot of people, I think, especially with media portrayal um, and definitely a hurdle we have to overcome when we go to court and have to educate the juries is that intimate partner violence is not just physical. A lot of times you hear intimate partner violence or domestic violence, and I think people get an image um, in their mind of somebody maybe with bruises or a black eye. Um, but it also includes sexual abuse, stalking, psychological aggression, um, you know, emotional, physical, sexual, or verbal abuse, essentially. And when women are murdered in the United States, over half of the time they are killed by a current or former intimate partner. Two thirds of those um, are committed with a firearm. So what we know from this is that intimate partner violence and guns are certainly a dangerous combination. And when an abusive partner owns or has access to a firearm, the likelihood of that intimate partner homicide increases by 500%. It's a staggering statistic uh, for sure. And as already um, mentioned earlier, you know, a small minority um, of these intimate partner violence situations involve a weapon. But because it is so prevalent, um, you know, the total number is so prevalent, the amount that are affected by a firearm is still very considerable. Next slide. So weapons aren't always used to actually be discharged. Um, you know, the bullet be discharged and actually um, shoot somebody. Often what we're finding is that firearms are being used for that psychological, um, you know, scare tactic or psychological manipulation. So it's invoking fear, it's intimidating, and it's manipulating people. Because just as um, April said a little while ago, um, you know, you're going to do whatever the person with a weapon says, right? And so um, firearms certainly enhance those coercive control tactics. And just a patient, you know, of ours, a victim knowing that their abuser has access is enough to undermine their autonomy, their safety, their will, their consent, because those spoken threats are essentially used to terrorize somebody, to control their life. And what we know from a lot of studies is that um, that psychological manipulation with a weapon has significant impact on our patient's sleep, um, certainly causes sleep disturbances, and is certainly difficult for you to have a, a good night's rest when you are worried that at any moment um, you could wake up you know, to the threat of a weapon or a weapon in your face um, or feeling a weapon on your skin or something of that nature. So what we normally see with firearm abuse is a non-physical coercive control tactic, which must be approached um, as equally traumatizing as that physical abuse, right? And what's hard here is that the non-physical abuse doesn't usually have a lot of signs, visible signs that juries want to see when they're going to potentially convict somebody. So it's actually harder to prove psychological abuse, verbal abuse, um, things of that nature. And it's often why many of these will never see a day in court. Next slide. So we are certainly in a unique position to intervene and help patients that are experiencing intimate partner violence. Um, this is not new. Um, this has been in place for, for quite a while, but the US Preventative Services Task Force recommends that all women of reproductive age be screened for intimate partner violence. 
does not mean that women um, that are not in reproductive age or that men do not face intimate partner violence. The U.S. Preventative Task Force just took the population that has the highest risk and, you know, gave us guidance that these people need to be screened no matter what. Um, another governing body for us is JACO. Joint Commission um, is another name we call them. And they actually put a recommendation out about 10 years ago that said all patients should be screened for some form of abuse in a um, hospital setting. And then um, clinician responsibilities, what does that mean for us? We should absolutely be screening these patients, right? And then using that screening tool or even maybe things like body mannerisms and the way the patient's behaving or comments that have been said to then identify these patients. Um, we do have mandatory reporting statutes um, in, in states for different things. Sometimes it's for um, a penetrating injury like a gunshot wound or stabbing. Some states are mandatory reporters for IPV. Colorado is not. Um, that actually changed. Um, a few years ago for good reason, which if we have time, I'm happy to talk more about that in our discussion and questions at the end. Um, and then of course there's mandatory reporting related to someone that's a minor or someone over the age of 70 for elder abuse and things like that. We need to be counseling our patients on their risk factors. We need to be doing really thorough safety planning and then engaging um, expert advocates when desired by the patient. Could be law advocates if they're reporting to law enforcement. It could be community advocates, um, whatever the patient is comfortable with. And also depending on how they're, um, you know, if they're planning on reporting to law enforcement or not. And then when we screen for intimate partner violence, we should always be including questions about firearms. And those could include if there's firearms in the home or if the abuser has access to firearms. This screening is really an opportunity to provide information on risks, as well as to obtain some of that really important health-related information that we can then use to develop a very cohesive and thorough safety plan. Next slide. So um, again, not an exhaustive list of everything that a clinician could potentially um, assess for with intimate partner violence, but a few different things. Um, bruises, we always say when they're in various stages of healing, so that just means some new bruises and some chronic bruises, uh, multiple injuries, ruptured eardrums, any type of delay in seeking care. So they tell you that this incident happened, you know, a few days ago, but they're just now coming in. That definitely warrants some more questions by the clinician. What was the barrier to coming in right after it happened? Anytime a history doesn't match those physical findings, right? So when a patient tells us the mechanism of injury, we're looking for a pattern um, of physical findings on that patient that makes sense. Stress-related illnesses, anxiety, panic attacks. And then a lot of things that I always tell clinicians um, when I'm training them, if it's something chronic, chronic headaches, chronic abdominal pain, chronic back pain, chronic sleeping issues. And you've done a workup and there is no organic cause for this. You know, their labs are normal or their imaging is normal. Then abuse needs to be up there in your top three differentials. Next slide. The danger assessment tool is one tool that we use. So I wanted to, I wanted to share it with this group. Um, this is a free tool. Um, it's available to the public. You just need to go to the website. Um, which I have there at the bottom of the slide. And Dr. Jackie Campbell, who is still active in the field of um, patients that are affected by violence, she did a lot of research and developed this tool. And there is a special training course um, anywhere from four to 12 hours that you can also take to become certified in it. But basically it's a screening tool and there's a bunch of yes, no questions. And some of the questions are worth more points than others, meaning it's a weighted tool. So if you answer yes to question one, for example, that could be one point, whereas you answer yes to question four, that one may add four points. Um, and this is scored from zero to 37. You can see there on the slide that based on their score, it can tell you if they are, you know, maybe at lower danger or extreme danger, and then what the recommendations would be. However, what we do, counsel our patients on is that they could score low, like a seven, 
Um, but this scoring can change at any time because we do know with the cycle of violence that that propensity for violence to continue to get more and more severe with each incident is very common. And while maybe yesterday you were slapped, next week you could be threatened with a weapon. So um, there's no telling how fast that violence could escalate, but it will escalate um, over time. And so we, we educate our patients to that. Next Christine, slide. that's about two minute warning. Okay, great. So we also have them fill out a calendar of the past 365 days, circling every time something happened to them and then scoring it here one through five. One being slapping, pushing all the way to five, which is that use of a weapon. This is a great visual for our patients because they can start to see that severity changing. Whereas maybe like at the beginning of the year in January, they had some ones and twos. And then towards the end of the year, maybe November and December, they're starting to mark some fours and fives. Next slide. Here is that actual screening tool. And you can see that number five says, has he ever used a weapon against you or threatened you with a lethal weapon? And that one actually gives four points if there's a yes answer. So um, the questions that involve a weapon are weighted much higher. Next slide. So not all warning signs leave physical marks, bruises, or injuries. And that's really what I would like to have the takeaway be today. Um, I did put a picture here of a book. Um, I have no relation to this book. So, um, you know, no um, conflict of interest to report, just a book that's available that I think helps for a lot of folks to understand um, that, you know, intimate partner violence and domestic violence can be lethal even when there's no visible marks on somebody. So things that definitely we want to be concerned about, um, jealous behaviors, suspicious behaviors, controlling their time, telling them who they can and cannot be friends with on social media, where they can go out to, what they will, what they should wear when they go out. Um, they'll start to isolate. So, you know, isolate them from their friends, isolate them from their family, speak poorly of their family, maybe so that the, you know, the victim doesn't, you know, really hang out much with their family or talk to them anymore. A lot of gaslighting happening. So um, making them feel like they are to blame, um, making them feel like, you know, whatever they thought happened didn't actually happen. Um, so minimizing their feelings and not validating, um, you know, how they're feeling or what they are saying happened to them. And then threats. Um, and then there's also reproductive coercion, which is telling them they can or cannot take birth control. And then things like sexual coercion, where they basically threaten them if they don't have sex. So lots of different um, behaviors that we really want to ask our patients about and start to determine for them to help them see that this is really an unhealthy situation headed in, a, in the wrong direction. Next slide. Wonderful. All right. So my name is Abigail or Abby Hansen, and I'm the, currently the chief program officer at Safe House Denver. And I've been at Safe House uh, for about 10 years now. Um, and I will, I will note that although I will be speaking about programs and services that are specific to Safe House, I can tell you from my professional experience and knowledge of the DV world um, that many of these programs and services are implemented in the very same way across the state and across the country. Um, I think it's also important to note, so I'm a licensed clinical social worker by trade. I'm also adjunct faculty at the University of Denver Graduate School of Social Work. Um, but for important legal and philosophical reasons, I bring my experience as a licensed clinician to my role as a community-based domestic violence advocate. Um, it is important for us to hold ourselves out um, distinctly, not as mental health professionals and as community-based victim advocates. Next slide, please. So here's just an overview um, of our programs and services at Safe House Denver. So most people, when you hear the name Safe House, you think of the Emergency Confidential Domestic Violence Shelter. And we do indeed have one, as many organizations across the country do as well. Um, it is an initial 30-day stay with the possibility of some limited extensions. Um, so really is that emergency setting for unaccompanied adults and families that are fleeing an abusive situation. 
We also have an extended stay program, which is that space in between emergency shelter and transitional housing. So for people that are a little bit further along in their journey towards self-sufficiency, and perhaps those larger families, we can move them from our shelter program and give them an additional um, uh, 60 to 90 days uh, for them to find sort of the next step in their housing journey. Our counseling and advocacy center is really the heart of our non-residential programming. So for survivors who are not necessarily experiencing an acute housing crisis, but need the support of a confidential community-based advocate, uh, we have individual counseling as well as group support. This is often the space that our advocates are working with survivors on things like those ERPO laws that was mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, so although Colorado does have um, an ERPO law, um, it really takes the knowledge of community-based advocates and survivors that it's even there and how to access it. Um, so that's uh, one of the pieces that we work on in our non-residential setting. Our 24 hour crisis and information hotline really kind of pulls all of our programming together um, and is a space for survivors to reach out and engage in any of our services. Our youth advocacy program um, is a is a, a program that recognizes that young people really between the age range, I anecdotally, I believe between 16 and 24 that are most at risk of experiencing dating violence and really targeting young people um, in both an intervention, from both an intervention lens and a prevention lens. And then of course our community education and partnerships that include this presentation here and larger platforms to do policy level advocacy. Again, that ERPA law was something that Safe House Denver was um, involved in, in terms of advocating for and um, making sure that our advocates have ongoing training to um, really work with survivors who are need to tap into, um, need to tap into that. Next slide, please. So how survivors arrive in our services, I think this is important to kind of uh, debunk the, the myth that survivors, um, you know, go through the cycle of violence and once the tension building phase moves into this acute episode, that that is the moment that, you know, sort of um, a survivor might realize um, you know, this is enough and I'm going to leave. Um, actually, it takes it oftentimes survivors uh, move through that cycle with their perpetrator many, many, many times um, before they feel that they are ready or safe to try to exit that relationship. So particularly in our non-residential counseling and advocacy center, we often see survivors that are actively still in their abusive relationship. And so the, the process of identifying safety concerns, including screening for weapons and firearms is, is ongoing. Um, so a survivor situation when they first met with their advocate may change in two weeks, two months, two years. And it's sort of a constant reevaluation for those survivors as they're navigating whether, or it, whether they are going to leave and if they are when. Um, so those survivors who are engaging in that process of leaving their abusive relationship, um, again, oftentimes sort of the, the community thinks that the next logical step for somebody is to come to an emergency shelter. Um, certainly we have that resource available, uh, but the reality is that our shelter is typically full and we have one of the larger shelters in the state. Um, most domestic violence shelters are typically full. We turn away thousands of people a year. So accessing shelter, number one, isn't the easiest thing to do. Um, and number two is not most people's, um, you know, first option. Most survivors have some limited resources available and they will exhaust those resources until they're in a place where they need to reach out to shelter. Shelter is, um, it's a community living setting you are expected to, to live with other traumatized people um, and bring your family along for, for, um, for adults that are bringing, that have children that are affected by domestic violence as well. And that's not often people's first choice. They might couch surf for a while. Perhaps they have some money for a motel for a little bit, live in their car, um, but it takes a little bit to get to shelter typically. 
And then we see survivors who are really working on post-domestic violence trauma concerns. So in our counseling and advocacy center, we might get a referral for a survivor who successfully and safely left their abuser 20 years ago and have kind of moved through their life. And now they're at a place when they are either um, exploring new relationships and some of those trauma triggers are coming up or finally feel safe and secure enough in, in their lives and their home to, to do sort of the, the old work of healing through trauma. Next slide, please. So the impact of domestic violence trauma, clearly there are physical impacts, but also there are psychological impacts as well. One of the biggest pieces I think that we are constantly working with as community-based domestic violence advocates is understanding behaviors for somebody who has experienced domestic violence trauma. So we might see a survivor who either um, severely under appreciates their safety concerns um, because they've been so exposed to threats and violence that um, don't necessarily view their situation as, um, as uh, dangerously as we might. Or the other way around, we might have particularly survivors that come into shelter who um, experience uh, strong reactions that fight, flight, or freeze response from things that really are kind of normal human conflict. Um, and so our, our model of trauma-informed care guides us to really um, support survivors with um, understanding kind of their own reactions to certain triggers and identifying is this reaction based on a true safety concern or is this a reaction that is based on um, my old uh, exposure to trauma that has caused me to be overly reactive. So things like roommate conflict is something we are constantly navigating. Uh, we also really lean into empowerment-based and survivor-centered practices, knowing that the survivor is the expert of their own journey and their choices are not mine or our advocates to make. Um, so we often do see survivors who make choices um, to go back to their abuser. Uh, maybe they leave shelter and do go back to an un a, a situation that I would view as unsafe. Um, my role is not to advise, but my role is to support and walk along with survivor. Next slide, please. So really kind of taking that focus back to the piece around how firearms are used in intimate violence uh, situations. So we've heard early on um, in this presentation and throughout the presentation that the, the presence of a gun in a domestic violence situation increases that risk of homicide. That is something that I know and hold um, as an advocate. It's not necessarily something that survivors in their own lived experience um, walk through their life sort of recognizing. Um, many survivors who have been threatened with a gun and have ongoing threats with weapons in their abusive relationship for their own ability to continue to sort of mentally navigate their life really need to minimize um, the significance of that. Um, we also know that threats of gun violence are often enough. So perpetrators, use the least amount of physical violence necessary in order to maintain power and control. And if a perpetrator is able to completely control their victim by threatening to use a weapon and never actually showing the weapon or discharging the weapon, if that is successful in terms of their uh, goal of maintaining power and control, they're gonna continue to use that strategy. The impact of the experience of that threat what we see from an advocate side is the same as survivors that have been actively shot at or the weapon has been discharged. So um, we heard a bit about the danger assessment and that is absolutely a tool that we will use as advocates, especially in those situations where the survivors that we are working with don't necessarily realize the extent to which they are unsafe. Um, and we use it as a guide. 
Um, because again, our role is not to make choices for the survivor, um, but if we have a, you know, a, a sort of a, a non-biased tool that we can walk through with survivor and say, you know, this is your score. These are the reasons why I am concerned for your safety. It oftentimes can help the survivor um, navigate their own choices and kind of process that a little bit more with their advocate about, you know, why is it that this is so unsafe? What am I supposed to do now that it's so unsafe? Um, and talking through some different options. Hey, so, that, two minutes. Perfect. All right. I wanted to highlight one survivor story. Um, we did a number of years ago have a young woman in our services. And I'm, as if I recall accurately, she was around the age of 22. Um, she was still involved in her abusive relationship and was working with her non residential advocate to try to figure out should I stay or should I go? Um, she had been working with an advocate for a while. And after a few months, she came into a session and she had a new tattoo on her body of a gun. Um, and in sort of working with her in dissecting that story, um, she at that time was really unclear whether this was her personal choice or this was coerced or even forced by her boyfriend and was kind of reconciling what that meant and why he wanted um, that tattoo on her body. As an advocate, I know that that is a message to her um, that he has complete control over her and could potentially discharge that firearm at any time. Um, but it took a while for her to um, really kind of understand those implications. Next slide, please. So why we target young people. So again, we know that that age range, 18 to 24, I really believe it's 16 to 24, um, are most commonly um, experience um, teen dating violence or intimate partner violence. But it's really important for advocates to understand the difference between talking about prevention and talking about prevention in a way that comes across as victim blaming. Um, because we know that really the only person that is capable of truly preventing and stopping intimate partner violence is the perpetrator. So when we talk about targeting young people, we really want to look at the difference between intervention, right, and survivors who, have, who are experiencing teen dating violence, and true prevention, which is really a widespread, wide-ranging, healthy relationship education so that all young people recognize what normal relationship is, what healthy conflict is, and when things are outside of the general um, sort of normal dynamics in a young relationship. We also see ourselves as planting the seed. Um, we have young people that may come into our services um, and come in for one or two sessions and um, they sort of fall off and, and don't have contact with us for a while, but because they know that they've had a trusted advocate, we do see them pop up years later. Next slide, please. And then this is my plug here to recognize, respond, and refer when you do see intimate partner violence happen. Uh, we do, like I said, have a 24-hour crisis and information hotline. Um, this is the, the hotline that's available in Denver. Um, I encourage you all to um, locate your, your, your local community um, domestic violence organization and find the hotline that is most appropriate for you. This is a space not just for survivors or people experiencing abuse to call, but for you all as professionals that may be able to see abuse, um, you are more than welcome to call us and get guided support resources and referrals for survivors um, that you are working with. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Um, please feel free to the audience, please feel free to put more questions in the Q&A. We do have some great ones. So I'm going to um, hit on a couple of these. So the first question, April, is for you. Oh, this is always the big question, right? Like what would happen if laws were effectively in, implemented? Um, and so there's a question, you know, is it possible reductions in intimate partner homicide would be higher? So bigger reductions if firearm removal laws were more effectively implemented and then, but also relatedly, what are the barriers to effective implementation and what can we do to improve implementation? All great questions uh, from Kelly Roscoe a friend, um, but yes, if implementation were better, so if uh, courts were ordering these people who now could not legally, have, cannot legally have a firearm to relinquish their firearms, you know, 
they can get them back when the restraining order is, is lifted. If courts were actually doing that, if law enforcement was actually going to their houses and, and you know getting those firearms, it is entirely likely that we would see greater reductions in intimate partner homicide. There's, there's no reason to think we wouldn't. Um, yeah, and, and frankly, the fact that we do see reductions in intimate partner homicide when implementation is so spotty is, you know, just shows the potential of this policy. What are the barriers to implementation? Honestly, the, the barriers are that people think it's really hard and, and come at it, you know, thinking it's, it's a problem that can't be overcome or they don't want to overcome it. You know, there, there are you know, sheriffs, there are chiefs of police that are, there are judges who just do not think it is necessary to remove firearms uh, from a dangerous situation, even when that person has been legally prohibited from having a gun and, and they just don't want to do it. So that's, that's one barrier, but the barrier for the people, you know, who maybe would be willing to do this is often, you know, creativity and, and needing somebody to kind of put those pieces together. A lot of uh, counties across the United States have dealt with relinquishment one of the counties I like to hold up is Milwaukee County. Um, you know, they have a lot of forms and a lot of information online about how they do this. And, you know, it takes getting, uh, you know, the right people in the room and, you know, working out who is responsible for what. You know, the key is really making people responsible for parts of it. The judge is responsible for ordering it. The sheriff is responsible for getting it done. Who's storing it? You know, make people responsible so you don't get the, it's it's not my job. I actually have a paper about this and I can put a link in the chat. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, next question is for um, Abby. What is the typical length of stay for shelter residents? And are they taught to any defensive skills um, along with the early recognition skills? Great question. So the average length of stay is 24 days, um, but that really ranges. There are some folks that come into shelter for one or two nights, and then some folks that really that go through that extension process and even move on to our extended stay program. Um, as far as you know, skills that we might teach them in shelter, it would be based on survivor request. And I can tell you most survivors that are in an emergency shelter program are simply not in a mental space to be able to think about defensive skill, any sort of skill building. It's survival mode. Um, they are coming to a space just, you know, trying to trying to get away from this abusive person and survive the night. Um, it's, I would say, more likely that that folks towards the end of their stay and folks in the extended stay program start reaching out to their case manager to ask about engaging in some of those um, those kinds of skill building activities. And then we see it much more frequently in our non-residential counseling and advocacy center where survivors have a little bit more um, stability and are a little bit further along in their journey towards self-sufficiency. Wonderful. Thanks. Um, Christine, I'm not sure if we still have her. I know she was running to another presentation. Also, it's a busy month for you all. Um, oh, super. So question for you. Um, do victims tend to seek care at the same medical facility? Um, and is there any kind of registry used for domestic violence injuries or risks? Uh, great question. So, you know, it really depends if a patient is not in a safe place to make a disclosure, then yes, potentially they will be seeking care um, at multiple facilities, uh, you know, hoping that that's not something that would be picked up on. A lot of patients um, will come in with complaints like, I fell down the stairs, I tripped over a pet. I do educate clinicians that those are certainly um, red flag chief complaints um, because you know, women in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s were just not all falling down the stairs. Um, and so sometimes it really isn't, you know, picked up on. And it also is uh, compounded by the fact that some states, you know, the healthcare providers are mandatory reporters. 
And so the patients, um, you know, that would certainly be a deterrent to seeking care um, if they felt like I, I want care, but I don't want to involve police right now, which is why I'm super thrilled that Colorado doesn't have that. Um, and in terms of a registry, there is not nothing, there's no nothing like that. And the biggest reason is that would be a HIPAA violation. That's somebody's privacy. Um, you know, there's no way to, um, you know, force someone to report their injuries. If it is reported, then of course, you know, that data could be collected. But um, yeah, I mean, somebody's injuries and what they're seeking care for is part of their protected health information. Thanks. Um, I'm going to take moderator privilege to combine two of the remaining questions because we're almost at the top of the hour. There are a couple other questions if any of our panelists want to type in answers to them. So the question I have to each of you, though, is a little bit of a magic wand question related to the, the groups that you all are representing. So researchers, policy experts, clinicians, um, people in the advocacy space. What would you like to see happen in collaboration to, to cross those divides or those silos. Um, and if you wanna to touch on it, how do we navigate the political sensibility uh, sensitivities around firearms? So I'm gonna start with April. If you have any thoughts or sort of magic wand, what would you love to see in this space related to firearm uh, injury prevention? Yeah, that's a big question. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, if, if I had, a magic wand, um, what I would want to see is people take this more seriously. Mm -hmm. I think if people took firearm involvement in intimate partner violence more seriously, all of the rest would come along with it. You know, because a lot of people don't, you know, even in, so for example, we have a situation with domestic violence, um, but say the abuser, the abuser has five guns, but they never used any of them. You know, we'll have, you know, judges, law enforcement say, well, they never used the guns, you know, against them. So they're, they're safe to keep them. Forgetting that there's a, the first time you use a gun against someone is the first time you use a gun against someone, right? There, there's a first time and that can come. And, you know, so just really, really taking this seriously, taking gun use as an intimate partner violence seriously, you know, not prioritizing the fact that someone is a hunter, you know, if they're also aiming a gun at their intimate partner, you know, just take it seriously. Okay, thanks. Uh, Christine, over to you. What would you want with your magic wand? Um, I'm going to echo those sentiments. I think that, um, you know, everybody in a community has a voice. And, um, you know, oftentimes I feel as though folks have said to me, you know, or I just, you know, they've told me that, well, I don't really have any effect on the legislation, um, you know, or all I can do is vote. Well, actually, there are bills that are proposed every year, and you can go to the Capitol and speak in, you know, opposition or favor of any of the legislation. I've actually gone to the Capitol and testified three times um, on bills that are being proposed. So you don't have to be a politician or, um, you know, somebody with some type of high rank or influence to be able to have um you know, a place, a, a voice at the table as it uh, relates to legislation. Um, you know, just knowing that something is being heard at the Capitol, anybody can go. You can listen to the other um, statements. You can speak yourself. Um, and so it's just really important to get involved. And everybody um, has a seat at that table. Great. Thank you. And closing thoughts from Abby. Yes, absolutely. I encourage people to connect with, you know, both local community-based domestic violence programs such as Safe House Denver, but also Violence Free Colorado is our statewide coalition of local domestic violence programs that really lead wonderful policy efforts. So that's an important space for us to be active. And I think my, my closing message is let's not put the burden solely on survivors to maintain their own safety. 
they have enough in terms of figuring out resources and navigating um, their families and are just because of the nature of domestic violence trauma, often not in the headspace to be able to even really identify and kind of process what safety means for them. It needs to be on community partners, professionals, other people that see this issue to you know, advocate for things like ERPO laws and speak on behalf of survivors. Well, well, thank you so much to all of you for your time today and also for all the work you do. Thank you to Daphne Rubin for the incredible amount of work that she did in putting this together. And thank you to our audience for joining us. We will be sending out a link to the webinar and uh, that you're free to share and we will be putting it on our website. So thank you all, be well and be safe.